first and foremost to express the profound appreciation of the staff and myself and the members of the board for your continuing to support us throughout the year. As most of you know, this is the signature program for us and it is uh, especially important um, that you are here with us primarily because uh, in, in many ways this honors the legacy of Dr. Stone and also is kind of the point of recommitment to the principles uh, to which she dedicated her life and to which most of you, of course, have joined in in terms of continuing that legacy. Um, as I go on, or before I go on, I'd like to do a couple of very tidy little things and then I'll move out of the way for the rest of the program. First of all, um, I'd like to uh, identify some people in the audience uh, and ask them to stand and uh, so you'll know who they are. First, uh, I'm gonna ask the chair of our board, of um, our advisory board, uh, Chibi Boyd, to stand along with other members of the board that might be present so that you all can see who tells me what to do. <laughs> I'm also gonna ask uh, Reverend Haynes to stand. Uh, Reverend Haynes, the, the father of Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone, and let us acknowledge him. You're not a Reverend? Well, you're just being confirmed. You know. <laughs> okay. And um, I also want to recognize the staff uh, of the Stone Center. So will you all stand, please? Um, I'm also going to encourage each of you, if you have not had an opportunity, to travel down uh, next to the Bell Tower, adjacent uh, to the Bell Tower parking lot, if you haven't had an opportunity to see progress on the new building. Uh, to go down. Over the last couple of months, we now have walls that have gone up, the foundation has been laid, and as I was telling Reverend Haynes, even if they stop now, we have a massive foundation for the basketball court. So let's go down and let them know that we're still very much interested in them completing this building. Next year, this time, if we are doing what we're supposed to do, the annual Sonia Haynes Stone Lecture will be held in a new building. So, and um, also, the fundraising has not stopped. So, for all of you who are interested in ways in making that a wonderful and joyous occasion, uh, we still have opportunities for folks to join in with us we, are, uh, we have started an endowment fund for this lecture, as well as a number of other projects and programs, including fellowships for students. Most recently, uh, we were fortunate enough to receive $50,000 to begin an endowment fund for, uh, let me say it correctly, an endowment fund that will provide for learning communities, colloquia, between faculty, students, and graduate students to undertake uh, investigations over a term of any subject that they're interested in, in African uh, American and African diaspora studies. So we're moving towards that goal of combining uh, culture, community service, and research. So please continue to join with us in that. Lastly, I'm, I'm gonna tell you a very brief story. Uh, it's gonna be about a 45 second story and uh, then I will move out of the way. This has to do with our speaker tonight. She's heard this story before, and I'm, I don't want to bore her, but I want to tell it to you. Uh, and this is the first time I met uh, Pearl Clay. Uh, back in 1981, I was director of a very small community literary history uh, organization, one of these organizations that had a commitment to do workshops for children in the community, even if we didn't have money. So during those times when we didn't have money, and we couldn't hire somebody to do it. I was over in Northeast Washington and Southeast Washington doing poetry workshops for little children. Well, finally we decided to apply for an NEA grant, the first time I had ever written a grant proposal. And NEA said, well, we look at your proposal, we think it has promise, we're gonna send out someone to uh, evaluate what you're doing. We're sending someone, her name is Pearl Clay, you should be prepared to meet her. 
And I got, of course, very excited, ready for her to come, ask what airline she's coming in on. She says, well, I don't fly. So <laughs> you're going to have to meet me at the train station. So I go down to the metro in Washington, D.C., and you know, when you hear people's voices over the phone, particularly if they're gonna give you money, they always sound like they're six feet tall. So I'm looking for the, this tall woman to come marching out, and Pearl comes out with her books, and she's this tall, and I'm saying, oh my goodness, you know, what am I gonna do? And she looked at me and she says, don't worry. Tell me what you're doing, let's go see it, and let's get you your money. And that was the first grant I ever got, and that's what started me on the road to where I am today. So I thank her for that once again, and hopefully you will enjoy her as much as I've enjoyed her over these past 20-something years. Thank you.
Good evening. Good evening. There are two words that best evoke the legacy of Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone, scholarship and service. Dr. Stone was many things to the Chapel Hill community, including role model, mentor, teacher, friend, and social activist. It is impossible to fill such a huge void left by someone of her sincerity and dedication. But as with all great leaders, her ideas continue to inspire us to greater depths of social awareness and accountability. Her belief that a black cultural center was essential to every member of the UNC community in order to meet the challenges of the changing world is why our center exists today. Her dedication to strategizing and working towards solutions continues to shape our mission and our purpose. Dr. Sonia Haynes Stone was born in Chicago, Illinois on December 14, 1938. She earned her bachelor's degree in social science from Sarah Lawrence College, a master's degree in social work from Atlanta University, a master's in social and ethical philosophy from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and a doctoral degree in history and philosophy of education from Northwestern University. She also studied at the Duke University School of Divinity. Dr. Stone came to UNC in 1974 as director of the curriculum in African American Studies. She was chosen NAACP Woman of the Year in 1981 and favorite faculty by the class of 1990. She was also the first recipient of the Outstanding Black Faculty Award from the UNC General Alumni Association. In addition to her many accolades, Dr. Stone served on numerous advisory panels, including the Black Cultural Center Planning Committee on Recruitment of Black Faculty and the African American Studies Club. As Assistant Director, I know of the great impact Dr. Stone had on the Campus Y. Her commitment to the Campus Y was long-standing. She served in both official and unofficial capacities at the Y during her many years at UNC. She was a member of the Campus Y Advisory Board from 1975 to 78, and again in 1989, until her untimely death in 1991. Upon hearing of her death, and sparked by a workshop on activism, Phyllis, Phil, Facilitated by UNC staff members Howard Woodard and Margot Crawford, campus wide leaders coupled with black student movement leaders determined that a lasting monument to Dr. Stone's contributions must be realized. Those students decided that the proposed black cultural center must be a freestanding building named after her. It was a fitting honor for a woman who never missed an opportunity to share the culture, history, and experiences of the African diaspora with the entire campus and community. Dr. Stone was an advocate for social justice and public service. She was committed to the cultural education of youth and developing student leadership. Each year, the center pays tribute to the legacy of Dr. Sonia Lee Stone by inviting an African-American woman whose commitment to the community mirrors that of the late Dr. Stone. Previous lectures have, include, have included Alfred Woodard, Kathleen Cleaver, Sonia Sanchez, and Bell Hooks. Tonight, we are pleased to have Pearl Clay with us to help us continue Dr. Stone's legacy. Thank you.
um, it is, it's a real honor to be here. Um, you know, when, when my brothers and sisters say such wonderful things about me, I feel like I should just say thank you and sit down. Um, but it's, a, it's a true honor to be here. Um, I never met Dr. Stone, but I've heard so many wonderful things about her that I, I am honored to be here and to be a part of the, the furtherance of her work. Um, I just want to say before I begin that I have been, like I'm sure many of you, fighting a cold. So that I hope that I um, am not uh, called upon to grab any of these cough drops or bottles of water that I've got stashed around here. But um, I hope we'll make it through fine. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm going to talk a little bit about Love Among the Ruins, A Reader's Guide to Revolutionary Romance. In 1992, Author Terry McMillan revolutionized the world of publishing with her novel, Waiting to Exhale. An immediate bestseller, the book told the story of four black female friends struggling to make sense of their lives, or more specifically, the men in their lives. We watched as Savannah, Bernadine, Robin, and Gloria changed jobs, ended marriages, lost weight, talked back to their mamas, cared for their daddies, raised their children, handled their business, fell in and out of love, mostly out. <laughs> learned to assert themselves with a succession of sorry men, and finally learned to depend on each other absolutely in the face of betrayal, weakness, and duplicity from almost every other person in their lives. This moment of joyous female bonding is beautifully immortalized in the film version of the novel, when the four main characters, played by Whitney Houston, Angela Bassett, Leela Rashan, and Loretta Devine, spend New Year's Eve together at the beach, just the four of them, dancing and toasting each other around a huge bonfire as firecrackers explode in the night sky, the full moon shines down its blessing, and they commit to raise Robin's child without the assistance of the father, which is hardly surprising, since men at this point are not only visually absent, but largely superfluous. The New York publishers thought this was a romance. Of course, they were wrong. Waiting to exhale is not a romance. If anything, it is an anti-romance, a cautionary tale, outlining the dangers and pitfalls that await any woman foolish enough to fall in love and surrender her heart to a man. From Savannah's out-of-town lover whining about a pregnant wife who doesn't understand him, to Bernadine's devious ex-husband who leaves her for a white co-worker on New Year's Eve, to Robin's baby daddy, whose marriage is a convenient avenue of escape from commitment, and including Gloria's newly uncloseted ex-husband, who cannot possibly be who he really is and fulfill her desire for a full-time husband and father, the men in Waiting to Exhale are the women's constant source of conversation and complaint, but rarely the loving life partners these sisters are seeking. At the story's end, in the face of that reality, they choose to abandon their search for the perfect man and instead celebrate their female solidarity. This is not a romance. This is a sisterhood saga. And as such, it finds its roots in the work of Intisaki Shange's 1971 choreo poem for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. Was that an amen I just <laughs> In addition to being a beautifully written, searingly truthful, groundbreaking work, deeply rooted in and reflective of black female truth, in a way that will surely stand the test of time. In addition to all that, For Colored Girls is another severe and frighteningly real cautionary tale, where the men are not only the cause of much heartbreak and confusion, but include an angry, abusive father who drops his two babies out of a fifth floor apartment window because he can no longer control their terrified mother. After this horrific scene, the actress playing the distraught young mother, known as the Lady in Red, is surrounded by the other colored girls who comfort her and themselves with the words that close the play, I found God in myself and I loved her fiercely. Sometimes it is only the fierceness of that love, which is the undeniable blood bond of our sisterhood that sustains us and guarantees our survival in the face of all that we endure. But what Waiting to Exhale did that resonated with many of us so deeply was not to simply acknowledge the healing power of that love, but to celebrate it. Terry McMillan seemed to be saying, yes, life is unpredictable, but we still have the right to be happy. 
with or without traditional male support, with or without men who tell the truth and don't abuse us or abandon us or neglect their children, with or without men who accept responsibility for helping to maintain a peaceful, loving household and providing for that household financially and emotionally and spiritually, <laughs> with or without men who make our neighborhoods, make sure our neighborhoods are safe places in which to live, in which to walk, in which to raise our children, and finally, in which to grow old, sitting on the front porch swing, drinking lemonade, and telling our grandchildren stories they can hardly believe about a time when the rift between black men and black women was so great that we thought we might never remember how to be together, bound by love and honor, shoulder to shoulder, male and female, creating the kind of world we want to live in. Sounds like a fantasy, doesn't it? But it doesn't have to be. It can be our new reality, and because I believe in it, my books do not put forward a world without men, however celebratory, peaceful, and drama-free that world might seem to be. <laughs> the Sisterhood Sabas have shown us that we can create full, rich lives alone, and that is true. My books attempt to affirm that reality, while at the same time asking another set of questions altogether. What if we, as free women, could live these full, rich, celebratory lives in the company of free men? What if we could find men who treated us right and loved us, loved us as we love them? What would that look like, feel like, sound like, if it could walk and talk itself into reality? My answer to those questions is, it would look like Ava and Eddie in my first novel, What Looks Like Crazy on an Ordinary Day. Or like Joyce and Nate in my second novel, I Wish I Had a Red Dress. Or like Regina and the mysterious Mr. Hamilton in my new book, Some Things I Thought I'd Never Do, out this summer. All three books are part of my continuing effort to paint a picture of that new reality through the creation of what I'm calling revolutionary romances. Of course, I don't tell my publisher this. <laughs> New York commercial publishers tend to be as nervous about the word revolution as they are comforted by the idea of romance. So romance it is. But within the context of the revolutionary idea that black men and black women can have great love, great sex, great families, and peaceful, productive communities if we can just get the men to stop acting a fool. <laughs> any accusations of male bashing, a term whose legitimacy I would certainly argue. Let me say that no less an authority on human interaction than the late anthropologist Margaret Mead has written that the first challenge of any civilized society is to get control of the men. Any remaining doubters need only look at the nations around the world that men have made and continue to control, and which are, at this very moment, collectively teetering on the brink of an international conflict whose destructive power we can hardly begin to imagine to see the point that I'm making. In my books, my revolutionary romances, some men continue to be a major problem. But the violent, lying, insensitive, selfish, predatory characters are always balanced by a new kind of man. In what looks like crazy, the new man, Eddie, has been to Vietnam, worked as an enforcer in Detroit's drug underworld, and served 10 years in prison for a double murder. By the time we meet him, he has done his time, seen the error of his ways, and commits no act of violence, even when his extended family is threatened choosing instead to honor the women's wishes that he leave the bad guys to law enforcement officials. And I wish I had a red dress, Nate, the new man, is a police officer himself. So when the Shiro is threatened by the bad guys, of course, there are always bad guys. He is legally empowered to handle it, although he simply disables the villain with one perfectly aimed bullet through the wrist and then holds him until the sheriff arrives. In my new novel, Some Things I Never Thought I'd Do, the hero, Blue Hamilton, is neither a lawbreaker or a law enforcer. <coughs> He's a former R&B singer turned businessman who has chosen a small community in southwest Atlanta as the place where he will make a stand against the bad guys by guaranteeing the safety of those who live there, 
including the book she wrote, Regina Burns, who is initially disconcerted by a man who admits to taking the law into his own hands, but equally enchanted by the possibility of walking down the streets of her new neighborhood without fear of any man. I'd like to read you four brief sections from four different parts of this novel to introduce you to Regina and Blue. The story is told by Regina, who is recovering from a broken heart that led her to cocaine abuse. When we meet her, she's fresh out of rehab and has moved from her home in Washington, D.C. to Atlanta, Georgia, to head up a project at Morehouse College. Before she leaves, her great aunt Abby has a vision that she'll meet a man with blue eyes who will change her life. The other two characters you will meet in these sections are Flora and Aretha, Regina's new neighbors. Flora is there with her daughter, Lou, because her husband is trying a high-profile case against Detroit crack dealers who firebombed the family house to show their displeasure. Concerned for the safety of his wife and child, Hank has placed them under the protection of his longtime friend, Lou Hamilton. Flora, the downstairs neighbor, is in charge of a growing network of community gardens. Aretha is a character who first appeared in What Looks Like Crazy and reappears here under the protection of Mr. Hamilton at the request of her aunt Ava, who thought she needed a godfather to help her safely navigate life in the big city. One. I was looking for a place near the campus so I could walk to meetings. I had rented a car, but I like to walk. My own car had been traded away for dope a year ago, and I haven't had the money to buy another one. At first, it was horrible. I bitched and moaned every time I had to leave the house and walk the three blocks to the mass transit station. I bummed rides and tried to borrow my friends' cars until they made me stop asking. After a while, I had no choice, so I resigned myself to it, complaining mightily all the while. Then I started seeing the same people at the station every day and started speaking to them. Before I knew it, I was enjoying the chit-chat we'd exchange until the train arrived. After a few more weeks, I even started enjoying the walk. I'd take the long way instead of the shortcut, and pretty soon I even started recognizing my neighbors. After I got out of rehab, they all welcomed me back like I'd been away to war. The little old ladies around the corner actually baked me a pie and brought it over covered with a clean white dish towel like they were going to the county fair. That's the kind of community I like. A big city neighborhood with a small town sensibility. And it's just like the neighborhood that surrounds this campus. A few years ago, the idea of taking an apartment around here by choice would have been problematic at best and foolhardy at worst. The Morehouse campus, like a lot of black colleges, was then a small oasis in the midst of an area plagued with crime, drugs, homelessness, and unemployment. I never lived in this neighborhood during my five years in Atlanta, but the stories that made the news about it did not inspire confidence. But then things started to turn around. The crime went down and the spirit went up. The mall reopened and restaurants were always full of paying customers. Trash on the street disappeared and community gardens dotted the landscape. Kids walked home from school in safety and women moved around at night without looking over their shoulders. Ebony and Jeff had both done stories, and the Washington Post hailed the area as a model for African-American urban communities. I remember being struck by how vague the articles all were when it came to answering the obvious question, how did this happen? What was the catalyst for this kind of dramatic change? More police? The city says no change in routine patrols. Better sanitary services? City trucks come every week just like always, but nothing extra. None of the official explanations seemed to fit here. It was a mystery, and one that had intrigued me since I first heard about the transformation. If somebody had figured out a way to get a neighborhood full of black folks to live together like we have some sense, I was more than a little interested in how they did it. There was no denying the neighborhood had undergone a startling transformation. Gone were the boarded up crack houses and overgrown vacant lots. The streets were clean of litter, homes and lawns were uniformly well tended, and garden plots lying fallow until next month's spring planting cycle begins were fenced off and identified with signs proclaiming their membership in the West End Growers Association. It really did have the feel of a small town, even though you could look over your shoulder and see the skyscrapers of downtown Atlanta less than 10 minutes away. 
I left the campus with no particular destination in mind and just walked around for a while. I wasn't nervous. I've been living in the black community all my life, and I'm very much attuned to its specific pleasures and equally specific dangers. One of the first things my mother taught me was how to tell the difference between hostile and crazy. <laughs> this is an important distinction in all black environments, since the insanity of American racism is too much for some black folks to handle, and we will go off, but in different ways, and with different consequences for those who find themselves in close proximity at the moment of madness. It is important to know, for example, that the guy who quotes scripture at the top of his lungs is startling, but probably not dangerous, like the steely-eyed shadow boxer who never says a word and squints at each person person he passes as if deciding whether or not to throw a punch in their direction. The only ones who really scare me are the young hoodlums who claim as many corners as they can hold, sell as much of they can as they can of whatever drugs we're buying, and make the streets a minefield not easily negotiated by the faint of heart. Last time I drove through here four or five years ago, after a late night meeting on the campus, there were hard-eyed young predators on every corner, and I locked my doors for fear of being carjacked before I could get back on the freeway. This time, it didn't feel dangerous at all. It just felt alive. I stopped for the light before crossing onto Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard and looked around. The rapid transit station nearby was receiving and disgorging passengers who seemed to be a mix of students, young mothers, and working people. The presence of dreadlock t-shirt and incense vendors all hawking their wares with great enthusiasm and equal charm gave the street the feel of a busy third world market. The absence of aggressive panhandlers or dope fiends asking for spare change was a pleasant surprise. There were, in fact, no bug-eyed addicts or angry beggars at this busy intersection. Only three young brothers in dark suits and bow ties offering Muhammad speaks or bean pies, depending on whether you were looking to feed your head or your face. <laughs> the mall across the street was a bustling beehive of activity with people moving in and out in a constant stream. The Krispy Kreme donut shop was flashing a sign for hot donuts, and people in business suits, baggy blue jeans, and all manner of apparel in between were coming out with a long, flat box that means they just bought a dozen. <laughs> I turned down Abernathy, the area's main commercial strip, and kept walking. After the Krispy Kreme, I passed two men's clothing shops, a barber shop, an African import bazaar where you could also get your braids done, and a tiny Chinese takeout place. The West End News was nestled between a flower shop displaying a huge arrangement of birds of paradise and a 24-hour beauty salon that claimed expertise in touch-ups, blowouts, wraps, sperms, braids, waves, and weaves. <laughs> the windows of the newsstand were frosted so you couldn't see inside from the street, but next door I could see a few sisters in various stages of the hairdo process. One was under the dryer with her eyes closed and a peaceful look on her face. One was being combed out by her stylist, and two others were waiting patiently for their turns under those little heated caps that put the hot in hot oil treat. <laughs> I had never seen a 24-hour beauty salon, and while it seemed like a money-making idea, I wondered if the women didn't get nervous leaving at 4 o'clock in the morning, walking to their cars all alone. On the other hand, if they felt safe enough to do that, maybe this neighborhood was the peaceful haven I had been led to believe it was these days. Running off of Abernathy were a series of quiet, tree-lined streets, some with lovingly restored Victorian homes, some with multifamily dwellings, and a few small apartment clusters that housed the area's more transient populations without seeming to change the surprisingly serene atmosphere of the community as a whole. I was strolling down one of those streets whose almost unearthly calm seemed a thousand miles from the bustling energy of the commercial strip. Not that there was no activity here. In fact, there seemed to be brothers in motion all over the place. Over there was a man working on his car. Two doors down was another man repairing a screen door. A little further on, a man was raking leaves in the yard of a brightly painted cottage with a gaggle of pink plastic flamingos stationed along the driveway like sentinels. <coughs> Several of the men inclined their heads slightly to acknowledge my passing by, but otherwise, they were all about whatever task lay before them. I realized how good it was to see men around visible and working, and how rare. When I heard the voice of Bob Marley coming from the open windows of a house at the end of a block, it seemed the perfect soundtrack for the serenity of the street. 
Don't worry about a thing, Bob saying, because every little thing is going to be all right. I love this song. I played it so many times when I first got out of rehab that it's permanently etched on my brain. I stopped in front of the house where the music was playing and listened to it like they were playing it just for me. The building was a four-unit gray stucco with a perfectly manicured lawn and a bright blue front door. The large lot beside it had a sign that identified it as one of the neighborhood's many community gardens and boasted three rows of the prettiest winter collard greens you ever saw. Too bad this building doesn't have a vacancy, I thought. This would be perfect. That's when the blue front door opened and a man came out wearing a black cashmere overcoat, a black Homburg, and sunglasses. He looked like Michael Corleone in The Godfather when the boy has finally embraced his destiny and become a show enough gangster. <laughs> he walked straight over to me, smiled pleasantly, and removed his glasses, rendering me temporarily speechless. Can I help you, he said. It was his eye. The brother had the bluest eyes I've ever seen in my life. They were even more shocking, and that's what they were, shocking, because he was so perfectly dark, African dark. His skin was the kind of soft, velvety black you don't see over here much anymore, now that we're all so mixed up and miscegenated like good citizens of the 21st century. <laughs> As if in defiance of the Middle Passage and despite the complicated racial mixtures that define the diaspora, this brother's skin was original black. Did I say he was also fine as hell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the king of an African warrior king on one of those black history calendars except for those eyes. Not baby blue or gray blue or cornflower blue. His eyes were turquoise like the jewelry they make in the Southwest because that's the color of their sky and sunset. Turquoise like the water around those Caribbean islands where all you want to do is drink rum and make love. I knew I was staring, but I couldn't look away. I took a breath and tried to collect myself. I don't rattle easily, but I hadn't expected Aunt Abby's vision to kick in quite so fast. <laughs> do we know each other? He was still smiling. I, I was just listening to the music, I finally stuttered. Bob Marley. My painter is a big reggae fan, he said. I hope it wasn't disturbing you. Oh, no, not at all, I said. I'm, I'm a reggae fan, too, old school. His eyes actually seemed to twinkle at me. Are you new to the neighborhood? I wish, I said, wondering when the big black Lincoln had pulled up soundlessly to the curb behind me. There don't seem to be many vacancies around here. He looked at me for a long moment, which was fine with me, because it gave me an excuse to look back. <laughs> I wondered if those eyes ran in his family. I could just picture them all sitting around the dining room table twinkling at each other. <laughs> this place has a vacancy, he said. It does. He took off his hat and extended his hand. I'm Blue Hamilton. I own this building. I didn't have to ask why they called it Blue. His hand was cool to the touch, but not rough. Regina Burns, I said. It's the unit on the left, straight up the stairs, he said. It's freshly painted, reasonably priced, and you'll be completely safe. How much is the rent? He smiled. Why don't you take a look at it, and if you're interested, come by my office at the West End News. I'm sure we can work something out. All right, I said, remembering the newsstand with the frosted windows. Did he own that, too? Aretha can show you the place and answer any questions you have. If you like it, you can pick up the key this afternoon. How's that? Wonderful, I said. The truth is, I was standing here hoping there was a vacancy in this building just before you came outside, so your timing is perfect. That's my job, he said, as the man standing at the curb opened the rear passenger door. I'm pleased I could be of assistance. Then he bowed again, walked over to the car, and disappeared into its black leather interior. The man at the curb closed the door, got in behind the wheel, and eased the car on down the street before I could even say thank you. I felt like I had fallen through the rabbit hole and come out into a peaceful place filled with thriving black businesses, industrious black men, a 24-hour beauty shop, and a blue-eyed gangster with a house painter who likes Bob Marley. <laughs> there was only one thing for me to do, go upstairs and introduce myself to Marita. Two. The sole vegetarian restaurant is nestled between a store selling traditional African clothing and a banquet hall whose price list was posted in the window for wedding receptions, graduation, anniversary, and Kwanzaa parties, and the occasional high school reunion. <coughs> when Flora and I stepped inside the restaurant, the spicy aromas and warm atmosphere appealed to me immediately. This was clearly my new favorite restaurant. 
The people who work here seem to be part of some organization that has black entrepreneurship as part of its overall mission to uplift the race. They are soft-spoken, neatly dressed, and have the slightly self-congratulatory air that descends on some folks when they stop eating meat, even though they're still wearing leather shoes. <laughs> because I couldn't resist the thick layer of cheese on top and a ginger beer that was so spicy it brought tears to my eyes. Flora, who was clearly a regular, got the collard green quiche, apple carrot juice, and a cup of jasmine tea. The booth near the window was open and we took it. The food tasted even better than it looked and for a minute we just enjoyed our choices. But my brain was still swirling about what she'd said back at her apartment and I eased it back into the conversation. What did you mean when you said Mr. Hamilton had a plan for me? I still felt forward calling him blue. I didn't mean to make it sound sinister, she said with a reassuring smile, but I've known Blue for 15 years. I know how his mind works. That's how he got me to take charge of the gardens. She took a bite of her quiche and pointed the fork with a layer of collards and the custard. These are my greens. My gardeners supply this place with all their vegetables in the summer. In the winter, all we can do are greens, but come summer, our tomatoes are legendary. Tell me about the gardens, I said, taking a tiny sip of my ginger beer and hoping this would give me some idea about what kind of plan we were talking about. The gardens, she said. How can I tell you about the gardens? Start at the beginning, I said. It was cozy in here, and I was in no hurry to get back home. Flora wiped her mouth delicately with her napkin. Okay. The first time I came here with Hank, there were still crack houses all over the place. <coughs> Blue had just come off the road for good, and he had made plenty of money, so he started buying up property, including the place we're living in. But he was really focused on the crack houses. He had already burned down four or five of them. Burn them down, I said. <laughs> my, folks stopped, my fork stopped midway to my mouth. He made sure nobody was inside, Flora said, calm. <laughs> Where were the holes? Flora shrugged. Absentee, I guess. Did anybody try to contact them? Of course, but after a while, when things kept happening in the houses and the owners never even appeared in court, things like what? I was trying hard to follow the line of reasoning that tells you it's okay to burn up somebody else's property if you don't like the way they choose to manage it. Last time I checked, the laws of the United States of America still applied in Southwest Atlanta, and property rights were everything to the founding fathers. They owned us, didn't they? Flora put down her fork and looked at me. Have you ever lived near a crack house? I don't think so, I said. You'd remember if you had. Flora's voice was tight and hard because it's a constant parade of the worst of what we've become. All crackheads care about is crack and all crack dealers care about is money. It's a lethal combination and you can't build a community around it. She took a sip of her tea. Blue tried all the good citizen ways to deal with it calling the police, tracking down the owners, talking to the politicians, but nobody seemed to care enough to do a thing. Then the crackheads killed a little kid for her lunch money right around the corner from here, nine years old. She was waiting for the school bus at eight o'clock in the morning, and they dragged her into the crack house and strangled her. Flora's eyes were hard as granite. Then they raped her. There was nothing to say after that, so I didn't try. Flora didn't say anything for a few minutes either. I folded my napkin and set my plate to one side. That's the first house Blue burned, Flora said quietly. And you know what? People were glad. They would have thanked him for it if they had known who did it. That's always the thing that makes vigilantes so appealing, I thought. They take on the bad guys by whatever means necessary. The problem is, who gets to decide who's a bad guy? Wasn't there an investigation, I said? Who's going to investigate a fire at a crack house with an absentee landlord? She was right about that. Abandoned and burned houses are a constant problem in many of our communities, seemingly without solution. What happened to the men who killed the child? Flora shrugged impatiently. What happens to crackheads? All I know is once the house burned down, that was one less place for them to hide. And that's a good thing, right? Her voice was full of fierce determination. Right, I said, knowing any other answer would be unacceptable. Is that when he started planting gardens? That brought a smile back to her face, and the tension that had popped up between us evaporated. That was my idea, she said. He showed us these four or five burned out houses he had finally been able to buy and was in the process of tearing down. He was so proud of what he was doing for the neighborhood, but he hadn't said what he was gonna do with the lots once he got them cleared. So I asked him, and he said, you want them? 
What did you say? I just laughed. We were going back to Detroit in two days, but Blue was serious. So I finally said, why don't you hold on to them for me? And when we come back at Christmas, I'll let you know. He said, okay, but I didn't really take him seriously. When we got back to Detroit, I forgot all about it until we came back in December and Blue had leveled the houses and cleared those lots plus three more. He drove me around to take a look, and as soon as I saw all that open land, I knew what to do. Gardens, I told him. We've got to do community gardens. Flora sounded as excited as she must have felt that day. So I made him a plan and we got some people who were interested in growing, mostly old people. And I'd come down every couple of months when Hank came down on business to make sure everything was on track. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Until now, the Growers Association has over 50 members. In the summer, they supply the produce for every restaurant around here. She glanced at her watch and smiled apologetically. In fact, I'd better get going. I'm meeting with the senior gardeners today, and they have absolutely no patience for late arrivals. I'll walk with you, I said, finishing the last of my ginger beer, and still no closer to understanding what kind of plan Blue Hamilton could possibly have in mind for me. Back outside, the air was a fine mist that promised a late afternoon rain. The people at the banquet hall were keeping a watchful eye on a delivery of those delicate, horrendously uncomfortable chairs that people use to torture their wedding guests. And across the street, I could see shoppers browsing through the neatly organized racks at the Goodwill store. When we passed the big fenced-in hole in the ground where a building had been demolished but nothing had replaced it, Flora frowned and pointed an accusatory finger at the eyesore. I told Blue he's got to get me permission to plant some corn and tomatoes in there this summer. That place is a disgrace. If they're not going to develop it, the least they can do is let me use it for the growers. Maybe he'll make them an offer they can't refuse, I said. I was just teasing, but Flora looked at me with an expression I couldn't read. I hoped I hadn't offended her. You know the other reason these gardens are so important, she said, as we started across the street. Why? Thank goodness she didn't sound offended. Because in order to make this a livable space, a real neighborhood, Blue has to do a lot of things that play to his dark side. I looked at her, but she just kept walking. His dark side? Have we now left the Gladfather and gone off into Star Wars? <laughs> I told him way back at the beginning, when he was just starting to burn the crack houses, that the problem he was going to have was finding enough ways to feed his positive life force to balance those other things. Flora's eyes flickered over a man dozing on the front steps of St. Anthony's Catholic Church, but we were the last thing on his mind. The gardens are about giving life, Flora was saying. They help Blue remember why he's doing all this. Something in what she said reminded me of what my father told my mother once when she was fussing about the lack of any visible progress in some community group or another that was not organizing as efficiently as she thought they should have been. You're looking at it all wrong, my father said gently at the end of my mother's tirade. You can't work for black folks because you think they're going to be different. You have to do it because you're going to be different. Flora was looking at me expectantly, and I realized she was waiting for a response. I understand, I said, sort of. Sort of is good, she smiled and nodded her approval. Blue takes a minute to get used to because he's one of a kind. You got that right, I thought, as she headed off to her growers' meeting, and I headed back to my boxes. Providing safe haven for the family of a righteous warrior like Hank, burning crack houses and planting community gardens, a dark side that threatened to swallow the light, Blue Hamilton seems to be part Don Corleone, part Darth Vader, and part Johnny Appleseed. I wondered to myself which part lives across the hall from me. Three. I opened the door to find Blue Hamilton standing there smiling and apologetic. It was 11 o'clock on Friday morning, but he was dressed as usual in a dark suit and tie. I was dressed as usual in a pair of faded jeans and an oversized sweatshirt. Makeup and hair drama have never been my thing, but I found myself wishing that just once I could run into my landlord when I looked a little more pulled together. I'm sorry to disturb you, he said. Is this a bad time? Not at all, I said. Would you like to come in? Thank you. He stepped inside and his eyes took in the paper strewn living room. Photographs covered the coffee table and most of the floor. Excuse the mess, I said quickly. Sometimes it helps to lay everything out where I can see it. You looking for something specific or you just looking, he said. Just trying to bring a little order to things, I said. He nodded. And I realized that was pretty much his job description too. 
From the kitchen, the tea kettle released a soft whistle. I'm making some tea. Would you like some, I said, enjoying the faint aroma of his cologne. Thanks, he said, stepping gracefully around the piles of paper lying in his path and taking a seat on the couch. He looked so comfortable, I found myself wondering if he had ever sat there before. The kettle's whistle was getting more strident by the minute. I'll get the tea, I said, heading for the kitchen. Do you take honey? No thanks, I'll take it straight. I set the two steaming mugs on the coffee table and took a chair. The sun was pouring in, and the smell of the tea and his aftershave made a, spe a spicy blend that any entrepreneurial aromatherapist would want to bottle for sale immediately. <laughs> I haven't seen you around this week, I said. Another fishing trip? He smiled and shook his head. Not this time. I have a couple of other places in the city. I try to have a presence there, too. Kind of like a circuit runner, I said. Kind of. I took a sip of my tea. It sounds like what my grandmother used to say. What was that? It's a sorry rat ain't got but one hole. <laughs> that made him laugh, and laughing made his eyes do that twinkling thing they do. My grandmother used to say that too, he took a swallow of his tea. But I think she was talking about something a little different. <laughs> How different? I tucked my feet up under me and wrapped both hands around my mug to feel the warmth. He had stopped by to tell me something, but he didn't seem to be in any hurry, so I decided not to be in one either. He leaned back and laid one long arm across the back of the sofa. His jacket moved with him and rearranged itself in a graceful flutter. Well, he said, most people need a lot of different places to go, to live, to be, because they are a lot of different people. They act one way one place, one way another. Eventually, if they get enough places so that they can let all their selves show, they can relax. So, I said, how many people are you? My problem is a little different, he said. My problem is that I'm only one person. It doesn't matter to me where I am. I don't change. Is that a problem, I said? Not for me, but it wears most people out. Flora and Aretha seem to be thriving, I said. They weren't the ones I was worried about, he said. It dawned on me that he was talking about me. What was I supposed to say to that? Since I didn't have a clue, I took a swallow of my tea and waited. Blue's grin was worth waiting for. See what I mean, he said. That made me laugh. I set down my mug. I have no idea what you're talking about. He nodded. Good. That means it's working. What's working? I wanted to give you enough time to figure out what you wanted to ask me before we had this conversation. Ask you about what? About me. The idea of having a chance to ask him all the questions I've had since the day we met when Aretha was playing that Bob Marley song was so unexpected, I would have dropped my tea if I hadn't already set it down. He was giving me permission to go to the source, and he was right. I had a thousand questions. So, of course, I pretended I didn't have a single one. <laughs> what makes you think I have any questions about you? Flora and Aretha both suggested you might have a few things you wanted to clarify. Damn, <laughs> Well, I did have one question I said, trying to regroup. I was at the brewer's meeting yesterday. He nodded, but his expression didn't give me any indication of whether or not he had talked to Flora yet about their request for his assistance. Some of the people, two women, are being harassed by some guys, and they wanted to ask you to help. Flora told me, he said. What kind of help are they talking about? They want me to meet with the young brothers, he said, and encourage them to behave in a more sensible manner. Encourage them how, I said. <laughs> he put down his teacup, and I thought for a sickening second I had gone too far, but his voice was calm. Well, to really answer that question, I have to go back a ways. I've got time, I said. He looked at me steadily for a minute as if trying to decide how to tell me something important. When he spoke again, his voice was quiet and hard. Twenty years ago, I had a buddy whose sister got snatched two blocks from here. She was coming from the grocery store, and a man dragged her over by the railroad tracks and raped her and then cut her throat and left her laying there. How many <coughs> stories like that have we all heard, I thought. How fast do we learn to turn the pages of the newspaper or put the for sale sign up or just thank the gods that it wasn't anybody we knew and loved who had met such a terrible, lonely, meaningless death. This cat, her brother, was on the road with me, played in my band, and this was his baby sister, so he was in a bad way when he got the news. When he came home for the funeral, I came with him. It was bad, real bad. Then somebody told me that she wasn't the first one. Somebody had been snatching women around here for months, raping them, killing them, 
tossing their bodies into the dumpster or leaving them in the street, and nobody was doing a damn thing about it. Something in his voice made the hair on the back of my neck stand up, but I had asked him, so I had to listen. <coughs> when we got back to the hotel, my buddy just kept drinking and talking like you do when you're drinking, but something he said stayed on my mind. He kept asking how they could keep electing black folks to the mayor's office and putting in black police chiefs and still can't protect a woman coming home from the grocery store. That don't make no sense, he kept saying. That don't make no damn sense. And you know what? What, I whispered. He was right. It didn't make sense. So I started trying to figure it out, and one day I realized that the answer was obvious. He looked at me expectantly, but it wasn't as obvious to me as it had been to him. And what was the answer? His voice was so quiet now, it was almost a whisper. We had to get rid of the bad guys. The bad guys, I said. He nodded. <coughs> what bad guys? His eyes bored into mine. I think you know. Of course I knew. We all know. That's why we triple lock our doors and run to our cars in the dark and don't walk in the parks alone and meet our daughters at the school bus. Rapists and robbers, wife beaters and woman haters, crack dealers and child abusers. A bad guy is a bad guy is a bad guy. And did you, I said, did you get rid of the bad guys? He sat back. You tell me. What had I noticed from the very first day? I could walk all over this neighborhood and never get noticed. The men spoke politely and always seemed to be about business. The absence of youthful predators and broken down desperados was striking and wonderful. I felt safe here. But how, I said, how? I'm a reasonable person, so I always give a man the benefit of the doubt, he said. If someone is acting a fool, I'll sit with him and try to figure out why. What if he didn't know what he was doing was wrong, I said. He looked at me. They always know. That's why it's so scary, I thought. Did the guy who killed Blue's buddy sister know what he was doing? And if he did, how could he do it anyway? And what are we supposed to do with him then? So what good does it do to talk to them, I said. Sometimes people need to be reminded of consequences, <coughs> Blue said. But I'm only required to remind them once. And after that? After that, they have declared themselves on the side of chaos, and they'll be treated accordingly. On the side of chaos. That pretty well sums it up, I guess. And chaos is always bad for women and children, but I still had to know. I took a deep breath and went for it. Have you ever killed anybody? He looked at me, and his eyes softened a little, but his voice never did. I'm a soldier, he said, and we're at war. He said it so calmly, it didn't even seem strange. I knew there was a war going on between black men, but I had never heard one of them acknowledge it so directly and declare a sigh. Why doesn't that frighten me? I said softly. I'm not at war with you, he said. But how can you just decide to claim a part of the city and then, he interrupted me gently, and then what? Make it safe for people to live in? Demand that the men act like men? But is that your responsibility, I said? Absolutely. What gives you the right? He considered the question. Well, it doesn't make much sense for me to be careful not to smoke a cigar around Lou and then send her out into the world and not make sure the bad guys don't keep their distance. Of course I wanted somebody to protect Lou. Of course I wanted somebody to make sure that Natty and Jerry can grow their collars in peace. Sure, I like being able to walk around after dark without looking over my shoulder and knowing there hasn't been a rape or a crack house in this neighborhood in five years. But what price am I prepared to pay for that safety? My head was spinning. You know what's funny about black women? Blue said gently. What's that? They're the only women in the world that you have to talk into letting you protect them. <laughs> Maybe we've just forgotten how, I said. Exactly, he said. And that's why I'm here. Why? To help you remember. The idea of protection is so central to everything that goes on between men and women, even when we don't admit it probably especially when we don't admit it. Blue's decision to take matters into his own hands and create a safe environment for people to live their normal, ordinary, everyday lives seems so extraordinary in the face of the chaos we routinely accept as community that I didn't quite know what to say. His unequivocal acceptance of the traditional male role appealed to me on a truly visceral level, but did that mean I had to become a more traditional female to balance things out? My mind was already on overload, but I thought I understood something I hadn't before, something personal. Is that why you stopped singing, I said? 
He smiled. I didn't stop singing. I stopped recording. The distinction was, I'm sure, crucial to a singer, the same way a writer will always separate the act of writing from the choice to publish. Is that why you stopped recording? That's part of it. What's the other part? The other part is a conversation for another day, he said, standing up and buttoning his coat. I've taken up enough of your time. No problem, I said, walking into the door. But what did you come over here to tell me? Whatever you wanted to know, he said, turning to face me. The truth sounds funny sometimes when you just say it right out. I see. So how'd I do, he said. I opened the door and looked right into his eyes. So far, so good. Four. Blue Porter smoked another cognac and spoke slowly, as if the right choice of words was all that would keep me from covering my ears and dashing back across the hall to the safety of my own apartment. I've been here before, he said, and stopped. In Atlanta, I prompted him gently. His voice was very quiet. I've had other lives. What? He sounded insane, but most people don't talk about past lives so casually, unless they're psychics or Buddhists or bohemian movie stars or visionary aunts. Last time I was here, things were different. I wasn't part of a group of people still trying to get over the effects of slavery, Blue said. I was a free black man leading a nation of free black men. My mind was whirling. I walked over to the window and looked out to be sure this was still Southwest Atlanta. It was. <laughs> Go on. We created a great civilization. Our libraries were the envy of the world. Our armies were invincible. Our culture was a rich melting pot of all those who found their way to our shores. And our healing powers guaranteed each citizen a long and fruitful life. I felt like I was listening to a utopian fairy tale. Your nation sounds like paradise, I said. His smile was sad. It was as close as men had ever gotten, but that was the problem. Problems in paradise, I smiled, but he didn't. We brought them on ourselves, he said, and we ignored them until we were beaten by an enemy who should never have been able to bring us to our knees. And do you know why they were able to defeat us? Something stirred deep inside me, and I heard a voice that sounded like my own say softly, because you wouldn't listen. But I just shook my head. Why? We were defeated by an enemy that was able to infiltrate and finally overwhelm us because they had a powerful internal ally we had never considered. And do you know who that ally was? Who? Our women. The women we called our wives, our mothers, our girlfriends, our sisters, he said sadly. The women we said we loved but never paid any attention to. The women we protected from everybody but each other. The women who had our children and never saw us again. The women we ignored and abused and neglected and underestimated even when they tried to warn us about the inevitable consequences of our foolishness. This all sounded so familiar, I wasn't sure if he was talking about past lives or present ones. The conversation felt surreal but not weird, and that's a pretty fine line in a conversation like this one where you're talking about past lives and such. And did they try to warn you, I said. He looked at me strangely. You tried to warn me. It was you trying to tell me what was coming if we didn't change our ways. But I didn't believe you. Why not? How could I? I was the emperor. Of course, in men's stories, they're always the emperor, or the king, or the president. In women's stories, we're always beautiful and smart and loved, not necessarily in that order. I told you what you were suggesting would destabilize the entire nation, he said. Somehow I didn't think the person he was describing would find destabilization a bad thing. What did I say to that? He smiled a little at the memory. You said destabilization was nothing compared to what was going to happen if we didn't get it right. I liked my past self. She sounded like my kind of woman. So why didn't you do it, I said. He shook his head. Because like most men, I was an arrogant fool. Good answer, I thought. So what happened to me? He took a deep breath. After a series of rapes and child murders, you left the palace and became a leader of the women's revolt against us. When you saw I could not be convinced, you left me a letter saying you would never return until women were safe on the streets and in their houses and in the arms of the men they loved. And then you disappeared into the mountains with a small band of warrior women, and I never saw you again. His eyes were sparkling with regret or tears. I couldn't be sure. I didn't know what to say. I've been searching for you ever since, Lou said. So you could apologize, I said. He took my hands so I could make it right. 
The war that sent you into the mountains is still raging, but not here, not in this house, not on this block, not in this neighborhood. In this neighborhood, women will walk in peace and safety and freedom, so you learn to trust me again. And then what, I whisper. And then if I am very patient and very lucky, you will fall in love with me, and we can continue our journey through time together the way we're supposed to. I stood up suddenly before I knew I was going to. Was this the plan Flora had been talking about? I didn't know, but I had my own journey to complete. I wasn't here to fall in love with an exiled emperor. I don't care how ancient his song is. I've got to go home now. Said, heading for the door before he could say another word. I had asked for it, but I was back on overload. He stood up immediately, his face full of concern. I didn't mean to frighten you. I know it's a lot to absorb. You didn't frighten me, I said, smiling. Maybe that's what's scaring me. That made him smile, too. He opened the door and took my hand. I hope we can talk about this again. Yes, I said, we will. Good night, then. Good night. I closed my door behind me and then leaned against it until I heard Blue's door click. My mind couldn't even begin to process all he had told me, so I didn't try. <coughs> there was plenty of time for that tomorrow. Right now what I needed was some sleep. I hung up my new dress, fell into bed, and pulled the covers up to my chin. It wasn't until that brief moment just before you fall asleep that I realized Aunt Abby had been right again. He was none of the people he had appeared to be. What well, was he? Tracy Sharpley Whiting at 7 